ਸੋਹਣਾ ਆ ਗੁੱਡ ਆਫਟਰਨੂਨ एवरीवन ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਸੋ ਮਚ ਫਾਰ ਜੁਆਇਨਿੰਗ ਵੀ ਸੀ ਸਮ ਪੀਪਲ ਆਰ ਕਮਿੰਗ ਇਨ ਸੋ ਵੀਲ ਗਿਵ एवरीवन ਅ ਮਿੰਟ ਔਰ ਟੂ ਬਿਫੋਰ ਵੀ ਬਿਗਿਨ ਟੁਡੇਸ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ Good afternoon to those who are joining us right now. Welcome. We'll give everyone about a minute or two so people can still come in and then we'll start. Good afternoon to those who are joining us. So we'll start in about a minute. So let's begin to be cautious of everyone's time. We want to be respectful on that end. So welcome to today's program. As always, we're delighted to have you all here today. If this is your first time attending our events, welcome. Um, please do visit our website so you can sign up to attend more of our events for the spring. My name is Bora Lachi and I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and Director of Studies at the Tower Center. A little bit about how today is gonna go. I'll introduce our moderator who introduced our speaker. After our speaker presents, we'll have a short moder moderated discussion followed by a Q&A. So please enter your questions in the Q&A function, the box that you'll see on the bottom of your screen, and our moderator will ask them during the portion. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Stefano Recchia, who will be moderating today's event. Stefano is a senior fellow at the Tower Center and a John G. Tower Distinguished Chair in International Politics and National Security. Stefano, I will now turn it over to you. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, dear friends of the Tower Center, welcome to our first event for the National Security Program this uh, semester, which I have the honor of directing. And thanks, uh, Bora, for uh, organizing this uh, uh, so uh, perfectly as, as always. So it's my very great uh, pleasure uh, today to uh, welcome and introduce uh, Professor uh, Chris Hill, who is uh, also a friend and who is joining us today from uh, Cambridge England. Uh, Professor Hill is somebody whom I uh, greatly admire. He is one of uh, the uh, most eminent uh, scholars in uh, foreign policy uh, in the world today. I think it is no exaggeration to say this. He, Hill specializes in first uh, British uh, uh, foreign uh, policy and secondly the foreign uh, relations of the uh, European uh, Union, but he has uh, published and lectured on a variety of different uh, topics. Hill currently uh, teaches at the uh, Johns Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International uh, Studies, uh, Bologna uh, campus in, in Italy, and for more than a decade until 2016, he held the Sir Patrick Sheehy Chair in International Relations at the University of Cambridge. Uh, prior to that, he held another dis very distinguished chair, the Montague Burton uh, chair of international relations at the London School of uh, Economics and Political Science. He has also held uh, uh, various visiting positions in this country, for example, at the Woodrow uh, Wilson uh, Center in Washington, DC, at Dartmouth College, at the University of uh, California, San Diego, UCSD. And Professor Hill is the author of uh, many, many influential articles and uh, books. Let me just mention uh, for example, that he's the author of a leading textbook on foreign policy analysis, which has gone through several editions. What are you now in the fourth or fifth uh, edition? I think uh, he, most recently he published a book on Britain's uh, foreign policy, right? Titled The Future of British Foreign Policy. And I think that his talk today will broadly be based on this book. So he will explain to us, I think, why the so-called special relationship between Great Britain and the United States remains so central to British foreign policy making. He will explain to us, uh, I think, what has changed for Britain and for the European Union 
uh, after uh, Britain's recent exit from the uh, European uh, Union. And I think he may touch upon whether uh, as a consequence of this, Britain can continue to punch as it were above its weight in uh, on the world political scene or whether uh, Britain's uh, Brexit has irredeemably uh, diminished Britain's position in the world. So I'm very much uh, looking forward to Professor Hills' uh, talk as I'm sure you all are. Uh, he will speak for about uh, 20 minutes or so and then I will ask him one or two questions to kick off our discussion and uh, you will then all be welcome to join our uh, discussion. So without further ado, Chris, uh, welcome again and the Zoom floor is all yours. Thank you so much, uh, Stefano, and thanks to you and uh, Bora for the warm and generous welcome. I'm very glad to be able to join uh, colleagues in Dallas, uh, where, where I'm six hours ahead in the dark in Cambridge, England, but still reasonably full of uh, energy and very glad to have the chance to talk uh, on this subject. Um, it's going to be a mixture of standard talking head and three or four PowerPoint slides, uh, which might help everybody to see where my argument is going. Let me first of all share the title um, so that you can uh, see what uh, I'm talking about. And this is my title, UK Foreign Policy and the Special Relationship After Brexit, Discourse and Substance. And I wanted to point out the contrast between the language and the facts on the ground, because I think that it helps the analysis quite considerably. And it also enables me to start by just setting out the basic parameters, the history in, in a way of the special relationship so that uh, uh, we can measure what's happening now against what's happened uh, in the past. Um, and discourse uh, is important because what people say in the press doesn't necessarily reflect uh, what's going on in wider society. One can argue that the very notion of the special relationship between Britain and the United States, which we all know has, has various important historical reference points, doesn't cash out in policy terms quite as much as is often claimed. And this report from the British Council showed that, in fact, there's an asymmetry, that the Brits tend to talk about it a lot more than the Americans. Um, and uh, on, in, in fact, if you go into wider public opinions, modern social media, you find very, very few references to the UK, which also include the phrase special uh, relationship. And those uh, uh, references which do um, usually come from experts, from journalists, from people who take uh, a, a strong interest in foreign policy. So most of the accounts using the phrase had more than 2,000 followers. Whether, whether the average member of the public in either country is particularly aware of it, uh, therefore has to be doubted. Now, of course, the special relationship began uh, in 1940 with Churchill's attempts to uh, encourage the United States to join the war against Germany and, and Roosevelt's friendly uh, response uh, right at the beginning. Uh, and therefore, and so we've now had effectively 80 years of talking about the special relationship, but it historically certainly went uh, um, uh, up and down. And you could argue that the wartime alliance shrank quite considerably over the period of the Cold War. I haven't got the time to go into the uh, to examples of it, but a, a few will suffice. In 1956, the Suez Crisis was uh, led to a, a humiliation by uh, on the part of Britain, who had to withdraw from the invasion of Egypt under pressure from the United States, which threatened a run on the pound. Later on, the British government of Harold Wilson, the Labour government, uh, upset the United States by not supporting uh, the American role in Vietnam and, and pursuing a policy of studied uh, distancing. In 1971, the Americans changed the whole nature of the international economy with a sudden uh, uh, breaking up of the Bretton Woods system, which was a great surprise to the British. In 1986, President Reagan and Mrs. Thatcher had a difficulty after President Reagan and Mr. Gorbachev appeared to be about to abolish the British nuclear deterrent, including all other nuclear weapons, after the Reykjavik summit in Iceland. Uh, 
So the special relationship was certainly not smooth and solid during the Cold War, although the NATO alliance remained, of course, a bedrock, not just for, the, for, for, for London and for Washington. Um, in the uh, post-Cold War uh, period, um, we see that uh, there were also some quite considerable ups and downs. Um, in the, uh, the Cold War period, the relationship, the personal relationship between Mrs. Thatcher and Mr. Reagan, which I once called a sentimental alliance because they got on so famously personally, but nonetheless, the personal warmth did not stop their uh, advisors and uh, uh, secretaries of state and so on, having their own quite significant uh, differences. And this continued in the uh, post-Cold War period. So again, a very brief flip through the ups and downs of the relationship since 1990. Uh, Britain was a, a, a strong supporter of the United States in the war against uh, Saddam Hussein, the first Iraq war. In fact, Mrs. Thatcher claimed to have persuaded first President Bush to have gone into it. Uh, but then uh, pretty soon uh, uh, during the Clinton years, there were tensions over the wars in the Balkans, which really led to some quite severe exchanges between uh, British and American ministers and officials. On the other hand, on economics and ideas about society, Clinton and Blair uh, often seem to have a lot in common and Blair's notion of the third way in both foreign policy and domestic affairs owed quite a lot to uh, uh, his thinking about what President Clinton was uh, up to. Then we get the uh, 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 drama uh, and tragedy of the 9-11 attacks in 2001, uh, where Tony Blair was the first to show immediate solidarity with the United States and continued to do so over the next two years in a way which turned out to create difficult problems for him at home through the second Iraq war of 2003. And I quote the phrase there, yo Blair, which uh, George W. Bush uh, uh, said to the, in the hearing of everyone to uh, the British prime minister as an indication of the asymmetry of uh, power uh, that exists and has existed right since 1940 between the United States uh, and Britain, because uh, glad as, as Bush was to have Blair's support, he was in no doubt about actually who called the shots in that relationship. And uh, Mr. Blair found himself in a, a rather difficult position once he'd given his word that uh, he would be with uh, the United States come what may on the Iraq war. Well, moving on, President Obama seemed to be less interested in Europe, although very, he was very popular in Europe and popular in Britain. Um, and of course, uh, more recently, President Trump was both highly in favor of Brexit and therefore uh, uh, at, at some level uh, uh, a good friend of Boris Johnson, but also so tremendously unpredictable that even uh, uh, Boris Johnson found considerable difficulties uh, in keeping British foreign policy stable at the same time as uh, maintaining a good relationship uh, with the president. And of course, President Trump had made life extremely difficult for uh, uh, Boris Johnson's predecessor, Theresa May, precisely because he thought Theresa May was being too soft in her negotiations with uh, the uh, European Union, and he would have done it differently, uh, as he said, on a number of occasions. So historically, we're now at the, at the present, uh, where we have a, a new American president, we have a relatively new British uh, uh, Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, uh, has been uh, in office now for a bit over a year, uh, and where there is some possibility of the special relationship being uh, put back on a more stable basis. And that is certainly, has certainly led to the discourse of the special relationship becoming more prominent than it was in the Trump years or even in the Obama years. Um, it comes and goes, but politicians on both sides like to use it, of course, for their own purposes to talk things up when it suits them but it often uh, tends to paper over some uh, important uh, cracks. And that brings me to what the special what is left of the special relationship, what has endured uh, over this long period and still endures, and therefore will pr provide uh, some of the fundamental uh, um, reference points for British foreign policy, if not for American, because I think the United States has got a lot more to think about. The United States figures much more prominently on the British horizon uh, than vice versa. So this is my 
notion of the residual core of the relationship, NATO. You could argue that if the United Kingdom was not an important player and a very loyal partner in NATO, it would be much more US dependent or conversely, you could say the United States would be less interested in NATO. Certainly President Trump showed uh, himself willing to call the whole thing uh, into question uh, on various uh, occasions. And it's true that uh, it's a remarkable historical phenomenon that NATO has survived as long as it had, especially given the fact that the United States obviously provides uh, most of the, uh, uh, of the power uh, and indeed the finance. The British still depend on the United States, probably depend on them even more than in the past for their independent nuclear deterrent. And since there is no sign of anyone in Britain, including the present Labour Party under the leadership of Keir Starmer, wanting to call into question that deterrent or indeed the modernization of its submarines and missiles over the next 10 or 15 years. Uh, we can assume uh, that the United uh, uh, States has got some important potential leverage uh, over British foreign and defense policy. On the other, on the other hand, it's, it's always difficult for the United States actually to uh, uh, threaten either de deliberately or implicitly that it might uh, withdraw its support for Britain's nuclear deterrent because of the NATO uh, factor that I mentioned before and the stability of the West uh, and all the rest of it, not wanting to undermine the whole nuclear balance in the world, which would happen undoubtedly if the British were to get rid of their nuclear weapon. But British public opinion in general has shown itself willing to consider uh, nuclear disarmament in a way, say, that the French never have. Intelligence cooperation is probably also a continuing important factor here. There are not only are there uh, historic uh, links, uh, not all of which uh, surface very often between the CIA and other intelligence, American intelligence agencies and MI6, but there are also, of course, uh, uh, very important American bases in the UK and in uh, UK uh, island possessions, especially GCHQ, the General Communications Headquarters in Cheltenham in Britain, Menwith Hill in Northern England with its links, the National Security Agency, and the Five Eyes intelligence arrangements between the Anglophone countries of Britain, the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, which some rather hopeful British uh, Brexiters have interpreted as the future of British foreign policy after the EU, that we can provide a kind of uh, alliance of those five countries in foreign policy based on the existing intelligence cooperation arrangements, which are in a way historic and go back to wartime uh, links. I have uh, quite severe doubts about that if anybody wants to ask about it. Um, I mentioned already the bases outside Europe. Um, Britain has, uh, the British governments have taken quite a lot of political flack uh, domestically and in the United Nations through having handed over their base at Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean to the United States for its air force and intelligence and listening uh, activities um, because of the expulsion of the Ch native Chagossian Islanders who are still in a, a very dismal position of exile. There are two uh, British bases on Cyprus, which are very old, used in, in conjunction with the United States. Ascension Island, which was a base for the Falklands operation in the middle of the Atlantic, is also uh, important for both countries. So there are lots of kind of practical hardware issues and, and uh, uh, um, information and intelligence uh, issues which bind the two countries together. What about wider foreign policy? This is where things come more difficult. You could argue that one of the reasons why the British uh, found joining the European community in the first place beneficial was not just their economic hopes, but also the fact that in coordinating with European uh, uh, neighbors, it provided them with a degree of cover or an alibi for not always accepting uh, that they had to cozy up to the United States. This first happened in 1970, when, of course, the United States was in the middle of the Vietnam War. And as I said, the British trying to keep themselves distant from all that. And there have been a number of occasions uh, uh, subsequently when, of course, Britain has felt that American foreign policy has not been something that they wanted automatically to follow. Nonetheless, so, so the European framework provided a very useful kind of alternative Western, democratic, stable, reasonable 
uh, grouping in which the Brits could say to the Americans, well, we've got to consult our European allies and uh, uh, on the whole, uh, we think that we prefer to go this way rather than your way. That's be often been the case, for example, over Israel, Palestine. Um, now, uh, that is not going to be the, the, possible any longer after Britain's uh, departure from the uh, European uh, Union. So we'll come back to that in terms of, of what it might mean. But I think that one, one should also acknowledge that even in wider foreign policy, both sides, Washington and London, because of the hardware connections that I've talked about, defense and intelligence, and because of history, have also tended to give each other the mutual benefit of the doubt. So they're very unlikely to end up in, in blazing rows and uh, obstructionism in the United Nations Security Council. So the default setting, I would say, is probably to give them the mutual benefit of the doubt. In the Falklands War of 1982, for example, the United States administration was deeply divided between those who wanted to uh, take the side of Argentina or Jean Kirkpatrick at the United Nations and those like uh, uh, Al Haig or, or Caspar Weinberger who took the British side and in the end uh, came down on the British side, much to our adv advantage in terms of being able to uh, break Argentine codes uh, and so on. Uh, even during the period of President Trump's administration when he said a number of things which clearly uh, alarmed both the British foreign policy establishment and wider public opinion. Um, there was a great reluctance to come out in public and uh, um, distance uh, Britain from what uh, the White House was doing. Um, more recently, uh, it's another example of hardware, Britain has got two brand new aircraft carriers, uh, um, HMS Elizabeth, the latest uh, of them, it is actually being equipped with 35 uh, aircraft fighters from uh, the US Marine Corps as it steams down to uh, uh, the uh, Indian Ocean and the South China Sea. And it looks as if uh, the, the, the use of these two carriers will be, we hope not actually to get involved in a shooting war in the Taiwan Straits or anything in that uh, region, but quite possibly to cover for the United States if American fleet needs to uh, be active in, in uh, the Far East and the British uh, uh, ships would take the place, their place in the Persian Gulf. So um, it's, it's, nobody knows how that's all going to go, but it's very difficult to see what Britain could do on its own with two aircraft carriers if it were to pursue a foreign and defense policy separate and distinct from that uh, of the United States. Well, what about the Biden-Johnson uh, relationship? I won't go on uh, uh, much longer. I'm sure uh, Professor Reck here wants to open it up, but there are a few more things to say. There was great relief in most British uh, foreign policy circles, I think, uh, when uh, uh, President Biden was elected, partly because of the possibility that things would become a lot more predictable, but mostly because President Biden has shown an interest in NATO, in multilateralism. Everybody knows what his views on international politics have been uh, over many years. A few of the populist hardliners, of course, regretted the departure of President Trump, but in Britain, hardly anybody uh, else did. The irony, of course, is that Biden is a multilateralist and Britain has uh, has to talk the language of multilateralism as a result and seems quite keen to do so. But its most obvious multilateral forum is the EU from which it has subsequently exited. And President Biden has shown a great interest in cooperating with the EU. At the recent Munich Security Summit, even the uh, pro-Johnson uh, tabloid, the Daily Express, noted that uh, Joe Biden snubs Boris, Brexit, uh, 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 Britain snub, Johnson in Munich speech, and Biden talks up EU ties. He doesn't mention the UK. Well, we've got a long way to go, and I'm sure President Biden is a skilled operator, and he's going to play it both ways. He's going to keep Britain in play, but he's also clearly uh, very committed to cooperation with the EU, both economic and political, and his interest in Ireland uh, means that he's going to be keeping a close eye on the rather erratic behaviour of the current British government, uh, which is clearly stirring up things in Northern Ireland uh, and which could conceivably lead to further outbreaks of violence, which would be tragic. Um, the, 
The government in Britain knows that it can't fall, that its exit from the EU means that it can't just fall back on the special relationship for the reasons that I've given, the asymmetry of power, uh, but also the fact that if you leave the EU because you're concerned about sovereignty, the last thing you do is to hand over your foreign policy to a much more powerful country, however well uh, 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 established relations with Washington might be, and however benevolent the United States generally is towards Britain. Sovereignty requires that you are independent uh, you, and that you have your autonomy in foreign policy. So how are they going to uh, play that? It's very difficult to know, but the way they've tried it so far is by using this concept of global Britain. Uh, global Britain is so far, I think, it's safe to say more of a slogan than a program, although in a week or two, the British will be publishing their new security, foreign security strategy for the next five or 10 years. So we will hope to see more flesh put on the bones. At the moment, it seems that it's inevitable that Britain is going to seek, as it is doing, trade policies, trade agreements, wherever it can get them around the world. But does it really mean on the political and military front that Britain is about to become more active in parts of the world from which it explicitly withdrew in 1968 with the famous policy of the withdrawal from east of Suez and the ending of British bases in Aden, uh, Singapore uh, and so on. The British have suffered a great deal uh, of uh, cutbacks in defence policy and a general reduction in government resource, despite the fact that uh, 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 Prime Minister Johnson uh, agreed a, a, a revival in defence spending last October, it's still not going to be enough to put the British Army up much beyond its currently about 75,000 men uh, or to take on any more uh, commitments on the naval front than is already done with these extremely expensive uh, aircraft carriers. And the idea that the British can actually get involved in uh, risking blood and treasure on their own around the world outside of an alliance operation of the kind that we saw under a United Nations resolution in the sec uh, second Iraq war, the first Iraq war, for example, um, is really, I think, not plausible. A lot will depend here on what President Biden decides. If uh, he seems to want to cooperate both with Britain and the European Union on initiatives, say, in the Middle East, we, we, we know or we hear that he might be trying to bring Saudi Arabia and, and Iran together, whether he wants to take an initiative on the Palestine question is not yet known. Um, then Britain does have diplomatic connections and a network and, and a reputation, which could help. On the other hand, Britain's uh, reputation for historical reputation cuts both ways. In this uh, era uh, of Black Lives Matter and post-colonial analysis, there is much more attention being paid to the atrocities that took place in the British Empire uh, around the world, uh, rather than a, a sense of uh, happy nostalgia for that period uh, or gratitude for British aid policy to its ex-colonies. And, and life is complex, so both of those two things uh, exist simultaneously. China is probably going to be one of the big test cases because under uh, President Trump, the British, Britain Johnson bent. British policy was to have Huawei important in British information technology uh, integrated into the 5G rollout. And the American pressure uh, led to that, uh, to them backing off. Whereas the European Union in general, although that divided itself on this uh, issue, uh, is, general, is taking a much more sympathetic approach towards uh, China, or at least a, an attempt to create some kind of peaceful partnership through the recent investment accord. And this could leave Britain uh, forced uh, to, to go down the line that the United States wants to take. Of course, we don't know how President Biden is going to take that uh, either. So I should come to an end. Uh, and I my conclusions are uh, essentially, let me um, come to some, some conclusions, that basically the Brit <coughs> Britain is an upper middle range power in the world, an important one, a member of the Security Council and so on, uh, important to the United uh, States in certain respects. But the United States is still the world's greatest power, despite its 
relative decline against China, um, it is still the hyperpower. And uh, that it's impossible to imagine that the two countries, even if they share broadly similar values, and all that is another debate altogether in terms of domestic policy, um, are going to have identical interests uh, in international affairs. My argument in my, my book, which might, might be wrong at the moment, it seems wrong because the British government is pursuing a very different line, is that in the end, despite Brexit, Britain is going to have to accept that it is a regional power still and that it has to work in some form or other with its European neighbours. Indeed, uh, Johnson admitted this in the Munich speech when he talked about reviving the quad, that is to say between Britain, France, Germany and the United States. But that runs up against the fact that the European Union countries and, even, and just France and Germany on their own uh, are very keen on the idea of strategic autonomy and see themselves as wanting to develop the European Union uh, as an alternative uh, power centre or a pole in a multipolar world. And they want to make much more progress on that, which the, the UK has clearly uh, taken itself uh, away from. So the UK will need uh, bilateral relations at the very least. It will hope to pursue those bilaterals with France and Germany, Italy and the Netherlands and so on, and, and Portugal, its traditional allies. Um, but if it tries to pursue a, a divide and rule strategy and hope that therefore the European Union will become less important and it, it, Europe will go back to a world of, of, of simply independent sovereign states, um, it might find that it's got a nasty uh, shock. Of course, I might be completely wrong. Some of uh, my colleagues, even those who were previously pro-EU have predicted that the EU is going to collapse um, and is doomed. Uh, but I'm, that's not my analysis of the current uh, situation of the next at least 10 years. You know, in, in the long run, uh, everything changes, all empires fall, uh, as we know. Um, but, and, and the European Union is a form of uh, Pacific empire. Um, but I think the future is going to be that Britain, it, Britain should try to maintain good relationships with both the United States and, and the European Union and its member states, perhaps as part of a general uh, notion of, of, a, of a Western uh, alliance in a, in a loose sense. And perhaps it also should, if it wants to go down the global Britain route, it should distinguish between the importance of global values on things like human rights and climate, um, as opposed to global power uh, of playing a role in every theatre of the world, which I think is now well beyond Britain's capabilities. So I hope that that will give you an idea of my general view of both the special relationship and the British foreign policy in its post-Brexit mode. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chris, for a fascinating set of insights. And also, I think we can say a very clear uh, presentation, right? Uh, often um, uh, political scientists use a lot of heavy uh, jargon that makes their arguments difficult to follow. This is most definitely not the case for, for Chris Hill. So I'd like to start us off just with two questions for uh, Professor Hill to kick off our conversation. And then I see there are already several questions in the, in the, in the Q&A here. So Chris, you mentioned towards the end of your uh, presentation that, of course, uh, President Biden in his first weeks in office has made an effort, of course, to reach out to and re-engage with the, with the traditional allies in the European Union, and in, in a sense, almost in his first outreach bypassing uh, the UK. So in your assessment, has uh, Brexit, Britain's exit from the European Union, really unequivocally weakened Britain's position in the special relationship because, as it were, Britain has lost what used to be its traditional bridge function between uh, uh, the United States and the European Union. That would be my, my first question. And secondly, you briefly alluded, I think, in your, in your conclusion to the fact that, of course, within the European Union, right, several uh, uh, states, in particular France, have traditionally sought to build up the European Union, in particular the European Union's defense arm as uh, an alternative uh, to, to uh, NATO. So my question here for you, in your assessment, will Britain's 
departure from the European Union and Britain having been traditionally as a very pro-NATO uh, EU member state. So will Britain's uh, um, departure from the EU perhaps facilitate and speed up the development of a common defense uh, policy among the remaining members of the European Union? And what could that, what consequences might that have? Yeah. Thank you, Stefano. Two good questions, um, issues I should have dealt with. Indeed, I had in my notes at various places, but uh, with time going on, uh, nice. I skipped them. Basically, I think at the moment, it certainly, it has certainly weakened Britain's position in relationship to Washington, given the president we have at the moment for the next four years. Um, but also structurally, because as you indicate, um, it's now not possible, either at the level of discourse or of practical diplomacy, for Britain to be a bridge uh, between across the Atlantic between the United States and Europe. Of course, I was always very skeptical about that notion anyway. I mean, if you look at Washington's relationships with uh, Western Europe, um, it, they've developed important relationships with Germany and even France, despite, you know, apparent French hostility on, on occasions. Uh, and those countries are regarded, in, as, at least as far as I can see, uh, as having been very important uh, uh, power brokers and ways into European politics more generally. So the Americans have not relied on the British, as it were, to mediate or to translate their interests into the European frame for quite a long time. The Brits have nonetheless continued to talk that talk, um, but it's now not even going to be plausible uh, to ourselves. Um, they, we will have to stand on our own two feet in, in, in a diplomatic sense. That is the consequence uh, of Brexit. And it's also the case in this context that in the United Nations Security Council, um, Britain and France are the two European permanent members, and they're going to remain that way because they can veto their withdrawal. Any attempt to make them leave, can be, they can veto it. Um, so Britain, that's a very important part of Britain's notion of itself and of global Britain. But what the British won't be able to do is automatically to say, we speak for Europe. Um, and uh, we can we, we, we will have a kind of bilateral with the French, mind you, that which enables us to speak for Europe. They may have an important bilateral with the French building on the Lancaster House Treaty of 2010 on, on defence uh, matters. And I have heard people recently uh, uh, in Britain talk about we must revive the Franco British relationship, um, but the French are not going to allow them to speak for the European Union. It's and le legally and politically just not going to happen. Now, the second uh, issue of the European security and defence policy, um, I have always been pretty sceptical of the European Union's ability to develop serious hard power, not so much in terms of its wealth or its skills, uh, uh, but on two grounds. One, that the, the European Union in foreign and defence policy, as you know, is an intergovernmental operation. It's not supranational. There are no powers in Brussels which can knock heads together. Um, and it depends on the key member states of whom Britain was one, if there were to be European Union uh, military missions abroad. So I'm pretty sceptical that that's going to happen. The EU itself has been weakened by British withdrawal in a pure military sense. The second reason is that there is across the European continent um, and actually in Britain too, an increasingly pacific mood in public opinion, in, not in terms of pacifism as such, but in terms of a scepticism about the value of military interventions, not about NATO or defense of, of interests against possible external threats, but of the projection of military power. So if France and, and, and Germany, of course, is, is the, 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 the locus classicus of all that, the Germans are the most pacifist of all the, the, the states in, in the European Union. So I think that the European Union is not going to be able to develop very much in that area in the near future, despite its claims. Um, and therefore, Britain will continue to be potentially important as a bridge between NATO and the, and the EU um, because of its past experience in the EU. But with the, with the passage of time, that experience, those connections uh, will fade inevitably. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chris. Uh, so we have uh, several uh, questions here uh, in the in the Q and A and also in the chat function. 
So I, if you agree, I would suggest that we bundle them taking maybe three at a time. I think you should also be able to see them here. So I will just read them out for everybody. And then, uh, so I'd like Chris to, to answer them three at a time. So I'll start off with the first question here by Tatiana Androsov. So how important is that uh, relationship today, so the special relationship with the growth in power of China, right? China being the elephant in the room, the renewed effort uh, efforts of Russia to play some world role and the increasing importance of a modern, at least, uh, technology Middle East. Okay, so question number one. Uh, number two, which I think is more of a comment by Sanford Thatcher. I trust our speaker has somewhere on his bookshelf the three volume Churchill and Roosevelt, the complete correspondence covering 1933 to 45, edited by Warren Kimball and published by Princeton uh, Press in a box set, each volume about 700 pages. If so, he will find my name at the end of the acknowledgements where Kimball thanks me as the in-house editor for what, uh, quote, what seemed an inexhaustible supply of patience, excellent advice and strong support from start to finish. It is a pleasure to work with a publisher that puts scholarship at the top of its uh, priorities. So it uh, looks like one of our members was involved in editing uh, this important volume. And uh, thirdly, uh, a question by uh, an anonymous um, uh, participant attendee. How would you advise Mr. Johnson, the prime minister, prime minister uh, going forward with dealing with Mr. Biden? So let's uh, leave it here for the time being. Right. Uh, in interesting um, and slightly unpredictable. The first question is not, not so unpredictable, I think, about basically it's about rising powers. I mean, clearly it, it's a preoccupation for the United States in the first instance about how to deal with uh, a rising China. Well, a China has already risen in many respects. So, um, and we know there's been a massive debate, no doubt in, in Dallas, but certainly in, in Washington over the last five years about this, how to, how to perceive China's intentions, how to deal with their changing capabilities and so on. Now, Britain is in, uh, like all uh, other countries, you know, uh, smaller countries, and Britain is a smaller country, although it's one of the bigger, smaller ones, um, is in danger, obviously, of getting caught a bit in, a, in a fight between two elephants. Um, and that could be rather damaging. Um, but you know, in a very simple sense, if there were to be uh, a, a conflict between the two powers, I mean, there is only one side on which the British would be. Um, but, you know, that is a very long way down the road. And the kind of conflict that we're going to see between the United States and China or the West and China is going to not, uh, with luck, take a military form. Uh, it's going to be in the area of uh, trade and human rights and spheres of influence and so on. But it's still, I wouldn't underplay it, it's still dangerous in terms of the South China Sea, the, the Chinese islands, the Taiwan Strait, uh, and, and all the rest of it. Britain has got this problem of Hong Kong. As, as you know, it, it signed a 50-year treaty with uh, China to, of uh, um, uh, two systems in, in one country, which China has now reneged on. Uh, and Britain has played its one card right at the beginning, which is to say that we will offer passports uh, and immigration to uh, all those uh, uh, Hong Kong residents uh, who uh, were eligible because born before the uh, uh, agreement was signed. That's quite a big thing, given that the Brexit vote took place partly or quite even mainly on grounds of resistance to immigration. Um, so it was a clear signal to China that uh, Britain felt that it had to do something, but its power actually, as we've seen, is extremely limited uh, beyond that. And sadly for the people of, of Hong Kong, the real consequence for Britain is that it has damaged the relationship between Beijing and London, which David Cameron in 2015 had said was the start of a golden era of commercial cooperation and sat in a pub in, in, in England with Xi Jinping drinking beer and toasting the future. All that has gone down uh, the tubes. So um, the special relationship in that sense provides Britain with a kind of safety net because uh, if it's not going to, to, to follow the European Union in trying to build important economic relationships 
and having what the Europeans sometimes rather naively talk about as a strategic partnership with China, then it doesn't want to be on its own and it's going to be better off um, following the United States lead. Now, you know, the old days of Harold Macmillan of saying that, you know, we are the Athenians to American Spartans, which uh, annoyed the United States hugely. They've gone forever. You know, we're, we're not in a position to advise the United States on what the good foreign policy would be towards China. We're going to have to fit in with it as it is. Russia is a slightly different matter. British relations with Moscow are extremely bad uh, for uh, reasons to do with the Shripal poisoning and, 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 and other uh, uh, activities by Russia on, on British soil. Um, and again, the European Union countries, some of them at least, want to uh, back off from the sanctions against Russia. But as long as things like the Navalny imprisonment happen, there is going to be a kind of uh, small Cold War between uh, the West and Russia, I think, which would include the United States and Britain. Um, and I don't see massive divergence there. The, the greater divergence would be between some of continental Europeans and uh, the British. Uh, I, I'm I note the, uh, the remarks about uh, Churchill and Roosevelt and Kimball and, and, and so on, not actually books on my own shelves, I'm, I'm sad to say, but I know where to find them in the library um, and uh, respect this kind of scholarship greatly. Um, how should Johnson deal with um, President Biden? I think with respect and caution and hoping desperately that he, it doesn't get the wrong side of the president, especially on Ireland, and hoping to try to persuade him that British Brexit policy is not a kind of small version populism associated with, with President Trump or let alone QAnon, um, but that the British government is now essentially liberal with a small L um, in terms of its social attitudes um, and that it's a reasonable partner. Um, but I fear that, you know, that the, the proof of the pudding is going to be in the eating on a lot of the important substantive issues which are on the agenda. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chris. And I, we have about 15 uh, minutes left and uh, eight or nine questions. So we'll, we'll have to uh, keep it concise. I'll uh, read a few questions here in the chat. Uh, uh, function. Uh, we have a first message. I'm not sure whether this is actually a truncated uh, message, but basically it's about, uh, so it asks the, the uh, US Marine Corps uh, 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 sent 10 F-35Bs uh, from its home base on Marine Corps Air Station Yuma, Arizona to the British aircraft carrier HMS Elizabeth, where they operated alongside the UK's Joint Squadron 617, the Dumbusters. The F-35 largest subcontractor to the Lockheed, to Lockheed Martin is BAE, right? So uh, the question here, do you see more UK collaborations with the US defense uh, companies and more of a focus on hardware than troop numbers? What can a joint UK-US foreign policy do to help Hong Kong. So uh, two questions here actually, and then a comment outstanding summary presentation as well. So this uh, question by uh, Wayne Trimmer. Uh, next question by Bill uh, Barnett. We can't know for sure, of course, but Taiwan, Taiwan may present the US with greatest foreign policy, with the greatest foreign policy and security issue uh, going forward. What is the current policy of the UK on Taiwan? And how do you expect the UK to react if the possibility of some kind of war about Taiwan occurs? A uh, very uh, relevant question, I think. Uh, and then uh, thirdly, by a uh, question by Bob Ehlert, does the UK perceive Biden as more than a one-term candidate? And does, uh, uh, does it question how much to steer toward the Democrats? Biden could be in lame duck waters in, by early 2023. And if I could ask you to mainly, uh, please uh, keep, keep it short so that we can get to as many of the questions as possible. Sure. Um, very interesting uh, questions. I think uh, probably the questioner is right that there's going to be more British defence collaboration with uh, 
US companies. I mean, not that the British have got a huge defense industrial complex, although arms sales are a very important part of our exports and BAE is obviously at the center of that. Um, it's one of the interesting things of the last 10 or 20 years was that some of us expected that there would be more effective um, joint ventures in defense between uh, British companies and European Union uh, defense manufacturers. And that didn't quite develop, I think, as, as we uh, expected. There seemed, even, even in the sort of uh, Airbus Industries relationship, which was positive for the British, that's more on the, on the civilian side, of course, but on the, it, it, the military, the A400 aircraft was not something that the British wanted to go with in the end. And um, I think that the, uh, the logic of Brexit is that, first of all, we hope to make a lot of money out of our own arms sales continuing, and that will affect our foreign policy because there are certain things that we will simply have to uh, suck up when it terms, when it's, when it's uh, uh, relates to the behavior of um, the countries to whom we sell the arms. Um, but also the United States is clearly both a market and an enormous source of technical expertise and investment. We shouldn't forget either that Britain, uh, the United States is a very important trade partner to the UK, not as important as the European Union as a whole, but certainly its most important national partner. And Britain is a, a very important investor in the United States itself of services, not just of, of hardware. So I would expect that really to be uh, almost Britain's only option if it wants to keep its uh, defense industries going. Second, how can we help Hong Kong? I think we have got to, the only option we have is to try and lower the temperature while at the same time making it clear that we think that the treaty needs to be respected and that to make it possible for the Chinese government, uh, the central government to back away from its current trajectory, which is that of increasingly hardline uh, repression uh, in in the uh, uh, in the zone, um, it's it can only be done, I think, by diplomacy, um, and therefore uh, it, it's the, the leverage of power uh, is is simply not available. But it's not beyond the possibility that China itself still wants to achieve a situation of stability in Hong Kong, in the sense of stopping a kind of uh, forest fire of uh, liberalism which would spread to the mainland. And if they can achieve that by whatever disreputable means, they may back off a little. And if the British can do that, then they will be doing the people of Hong Kong uh, a service. One should remember a little bit of historical context here, which is that Britain was almost the first, I think was the first country to recognize the People's Republic of China in 1950, 20 years or more before the United States did, and therefore to recognize uh, that it was China which ultimately should be a, a, a member of the Security Council rather than Formosa or Taiwan as it now is, which brings us to the next question, which which is that Britain obviously respects the de facto independence, prosperity and democracy of Taiwan and would like to see it preserved and would be very, very opposed to Chinese pressure, uh, let alone to the uh, proclaimed intention of militarily taking Taiwan into the People's uh, Republic. But in terms of taking a prominent uh, line, I think the, Br the British are not going to be in the front line. They keep their head down on this issue. They would hope to try to mediate, if at all possible, between Washington and Beijing. But again, I think that you know, the British uh, capacity to do that is much more limited than it, than it ever was. Their main interest, if, if conflict starts to uh, sharpen in the Taiwan Strait, is that of conflict resolution and conflict prevention. It's going to be the classic let's lower the tensions, let's get a conference, let's have, if, if shooting starts, let's have a ceasefire. I mean, that is undoubtedly going to be British policy. Last question, does UK see Biden as a one-term president? Well, you know, the, the Foreign Office, I don't know what's going on in number 10. Uh, they are probably, in number 10, they're probably relieved that they can get on okay with a 
democratic uh, uh, president after Johnson's uh, cozying up to President Trump. Um, and they recognize that, as I said earlier, the fundamentals of British foreign policy are probably less threatened by a Biden president than they were, were under uh, Trump. Um, but it, it's not just a question of ideological, a simple ideological alignment, because when you look back at the special relationship, it's usually been conservative prime ministers that have quarreled with American presidents. Ted Heath was the most unpopular president uh, in, in, in Washington. And the Suez crisis happened under a conservative government. Um, so uh, with a Republican uh, uh, president. So it's, it's it, uh, and we know that the British Conservative Party is not identical to the American Republican Party, especially at the moment when the Republicans still steam in the grip of Trumpian ideas. If the old Republican Party is to return, then all kinds of things become possible and a Johnson government will be quite happy to see either Biden as a one-term president uh, replaced by Republicans or indeed a two-term Democrat president, which probably in my estimation uh, would be Vice President Harris. Okay, uh, thank you, Chris. We have about five minutes left, so I'm afraid we won't get to all the very good um, uh, questions that I see here, but I'll uh, we'll, we, I, we have time for a few. So I see uh, Jim Holyfield actually asked a longer version, and then I think a, a, a more concise version of the same question. So I'll read the second more concise one. Uh, so um, what is the difference between Labour and the Tories on UK foreign policy post Brexit? It seems that Brexit will continue to dominate the domestic debates for years to come. So distinction between uh, difference between Labour and the Tories. Then um, a question here by uh, an anonymous uh, person. Uh, what is the current mood amongst Remainers post pandemic? Britain has been quite successful with its vaccine rollout. Has that changed uh, the domestic uh, um, opinion on, uh, on Brexit? Uh, then uh, Latin America. Latin America seems to be uh, the forgotten arena of foreign relations today. What will Britain's role be there in the coming years, especially vis-a-vis uh, -vis Argentina? Oh, okay. Right, thank you. Fascinating. Um, Labour versus Tories. At the moment, um, you can, uh, on foreign policy, probably put a, a, a thin sheet of paper between them in the sense that Labour does not want to put its head over the parapet. It doesn't want to mention Brexit. Um, Keir Starmer is desperate to put it behind him and to appeal to Middle England, which it, and also to the ex uh, Labour voters in working class seats in the North, uh, which have deserted Labour. And so, although himself a strong Remainer, he has now said, we have to accept the, the verdict, uh, we not just of the referendum, but of the uh, Johnson's electoral victory with 80 seat majority and so on. So we go ahead. Um, that is, they have therefore been rather craven under the current Labour leadership in not raising the difficulties of the trade and cooperation agreement signed by the Johnson government with the EU, which is basically a very hard Brexit and has left all kinds of loose ends to be dealt with. For example, the, the, the one astonishing thing, uh, even to me, and I have a certain skepticism born of experience on these matters, is that the Johnson government did not seek any foreign policy cooperation agreement with the EU when it was there to be had. And it would seem to be quite sensible to have access to uh, uh, um, various forms of information from the EU uh, um, diplomatic system where they, they abandoned, of course, the, the whole sort of Galileo satellite thing er earlier on. Um, and they simply said, you know, we're better off with a clean cut. We don't want anything to do with it. I think they thought that was because it would give them leverage in the trade negotiations and the EU would be desperate to have Britain as a security partner. But it didn't turn out like that either. So basically on foreign policy at the moment, um, we can see that uh, uh, Labour is more prominent on the human rights front. So it's much more uh, uh, vocal on the situation in Yemen. Uh, and uh, uh, But even in Myanmar, the, Brit both the British government and, and the Labour opposition probably take a very similar 
align in opposing the military coup. So um, in many respects, it's too early to tell. The question about the Remainers and their, their mood, and I, I readily concede I was a, a Remainer, I'm no longer an option, but uh, I believe that uh, our membership of the European Union on balance was a very positive thing. I think there is quite a lot of, uh, of dismay uh, and disillusion, but I think the country is still very divided. I don't think it has gone away as an issue, especially younger generation, I think, are pretty resentful at not having, I mean, the pandemic has, of course, covered over all this, but very resentful that they might not have the opportunity to travel, to take part in educational exchanges and so on. And they see it as a vote of older people of a more nationalist mindset. So this, you know, the question of our relations with the Euro with other our European neighbors is gonna come back on the agenda at some point, especially if the economic damage of Brexit becomes more and more evident. The vaccine roll up is a great success. It's given Johnson a bounce in the polls quite predictably. And the government must get credit for having taken a gamble in its early commissioning of the vaccine uh, purchases a year or so ago, but it shouldn't really take too much credit for the rollout, which was done by the NHS at local levels uh, with extreme efficiency and uh, safety with the help of thousands of volunteers. And I've seen this at first hand. And so it was the best of British society. The British government has certainly done good things on vaccines, but it's also got an appalling record on our death rate. Our death rate pro rata is much worse than that of the United States if you scale up the population size against the number of deaths. And this is going to be uh, the source of an inquiry in due course. Whether uh, Johnson gets away with it, as it were, is another matter, politics unpredictable. Latin America, the forgotten arena, quite right, in general in international relations it is, and yet it's one of the more peaceable areas of the world, broadly speaking. Um, Britain's relations with Argentina go up and down according to whether anyone in Buenos Aires wants to make noises about the Falkland Islands or the Malvinas uh, still, but they have on the whole been remarkably good in recent uh, decades. But the trouble is that although many British governments say there are huge opportunities for our trade and our cultural connections with Latin America, in fact, the percentage of our trade with even the bigger countries like Argentina and Brazil is extremely small. Um, and it's not like going back to the late 19th century when we imported vast amounts of Argentine beef uh, and so on. So I'm afraid that although we have talked up the possibility of important relations with Brazil uh, and Argentina and Chile uh, uh, in particular, um, I wouldn't expect uh, that to cash out in any very uh, profitable ways for either side in the near future. Okay, thank you. and. Uh... I think we will have to leave it here. So apologies to all those of you who submitted, uh, as I can see, very good uh, receptive questions and we, we, we won't get to uh, addressing those. So, so thanks very much again to uh, Professor Hill for joining us today and sharing his insights on uh, UK foreign policy moving forward after Brexit. Thanks to all of you in the audience for um, taking time out of your busy uh, schedules on a, on a Tuesday afternoon and uh, please uh, um, watch out for our upcoming uh, events you can find our, our programming on the on the website and in all the, the emails I'm sure that that, that Bora sends out so uh, Bora did you want to uh, make some concluding uh, remarks or yeah so thank you everyone thank you Professor Hill and thank you Stefano for moderating and uh, we'll see you all soon so have a great afternoon and a great evening Thank you to everybody for being interested or at least listening to me. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks, Bora. Thanks, Stefano. Thank you. Thank you. Good day and till the next time. Yes. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.